Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all. Having worn the coat to establish my bona fides as obviously intelligent and a scholar, I'll now take it off. <laughs> it's too warm and hot up here and we've got a lot to do. There are many, many people involved in what I have to say um, and the best way to, I think, acknowledge those people is in this manner. Two of those folk are here today, Dr Philip Playford and Hugh Edwards, both famous for their work on our VOC shipwrecks. Other folk that you see up there, uh, Jeremy Green, of course, who heads our program, uh, Chiller, a scholar who you'll get to know in a minute, Bob Shepherd, Juliet Parsveer, Myra, of course, many know Myra well, uh, Pat Baker, Walter Bloom, our numismatist, Wendy, our, our, our Dutch scholar, Alastair Patterson, who's going to be leading a lot of the, the modern work that you see, Jennifer here, one of the artefact managers, Nick Begordon, our scholar from France, who's with us, Vicky, one of the heads of conservation, Stephen Knott, um, you'll see him a, in a bit more with a facial reconstruction, Jeff Kimpton, of course, uh, not only a great diver and man who's built the Batavia facade and the Batavia uh, timbers, uh, but also a model maker of note. Uh, Dan Franklin, a forensic archaeologist, J.D. Hill from uh, London, uh, Partasius or Party House as we used to call him, a Dutch scholar. <laughs> Ian McLeod, of course, not just the director but an acknowledged, widely acknowledged conservator. The late Rupert Gerritsen, a good friend and also a scholar. Maddie McAllister, one of our young things that we're passing it all over to. And then we just go on and on to all these wonderful folk who you won't know because they are part of the Roaring Forties group and they are all part of a new dimension that we're developing now in using of the best technology as part of the Roaring Forties um, program, which I'll talk about in a minute. You will recognise Kareli Suter down there from the department. And then some of these folk you'll also know uh, from our group. Sue Cox, our department secretary, without whom we can't do anything. Uh, the, the boss, Alec Coles, Ross Anderson, one of uh, our people. And of course, uh, Ed Punchard and Julia Redwood, who will be doing film work. The others are scholars of some significance in technology. But I thought I'd just mention those who most of you will know. This is where it all began with folk like Philip and Hugh and the late Max Kramer and, and others around. And this is, these are the works that led many people to learn about the Dutch. And with the advent of Jeremy Green shown here, um, apparently he was that uh, focused as you needed to be in those days given the conditions and so on. The crowd actually had to send his lunch down to him one day in a, pa in a uh, plastic bag <laughs> with a lead weight. They were tired that he wouldn't come up so they sent the message down. It was naturally tightly focused work uh, because it was new. Jeremy headed one of the only three maritime archaeology units in the world and it focused very, very much on the timbers and the objects and the, and the various things from the wrecks. However, a lot has changed, as one would expect. We're talking now the time from 1971 through now to the present day. And we've all come to learn an awful lot more of the importance of Indigenous cultures and their complexities. And one of the things as a museum we do is to try to attend to part of that uh, missing uh, understanding and knowledge that that uh, was there when we first started. Here, um, Samson, or Jangali, his correct name, is on one of the world's oldest boats. He's predated in boats solely by those Aboriginal folks shown here at the bottom right, uh, with the um, canoes shown which probably go back to 30 or 40,000 years. The Wanjinas there are four to 5,000 years. So in deference to that, we also looked at our program of uh, strangers on the shore, the interaction of Indigenous people with shipwreck survivors. And I would have to say to you that this is much purer view of what Aboriginal people feel about the visitors to their shores than those who come with power, with hats, drums and all the trappings of, of those things. The one on the right, interestingly, is a steamship, which is both part of Aboriginal legend and European legend, which is part of our 26-ship database 
that has developed by one of our volunteers, Leslie Sylvester. Most of you are aware of all of this and most of you are aware of those who test the uh, challenge to Dutch primacy. There's many works on the subject. We've assisted folk with many of them. Bill Richards, for example, did this one. Um, that one, 1421, its best use today is for Debbie, the mother of our children, so she doesn't have to lift her head too high in the morning to see what the alarm clock says. Uh, it's an errant nonsense. Beautifully written first two chapters, but the rest of it are nonsense. And I'm afraid to say down the bottom right there, my eyes are closed for the brickbats that the Chinese at the 400th anniversary of Cheng Ho, which I was privileged to go and lecture there, uh, were not happy to find that um, Cheng Ho most likely did not come. And if he did come, there's no evidence of it. It's very interesting. Nations like India and China now casting off the shackles of their earlier colonialism are very keen not to ever again allow a colonial power to do what they did to them and to have been able to show Cheng Ho in a deservedly bright light to them is a very important thing. However, it's not to be. So the actual evidence for the primacy lies with the Dutch. Here's a lovely photo from NASA taken inside the space shuttle across to Dirk Hartog and the plate, therefore, because it is the only proof of this primacy of, you, of visitation to Indigenous shores becomes priceless. And the first thing that's occurred in recent times behind the scenes at the museum has been work on the de Vlaming plate. It's been led by Ian MacLeod and groups of other folk, and Ian, <coughs> Ian has just arrived. The science is far too much for people like me who haven't got right angles in their dictionary, and my great skill is building chook runs, but there's all sorts of work that those who are scientifically bent can follow. These are some of the images in Ian's report. What I tend to do with these scientists is read the abstract and the conclusion. And uh, the abstract is there. Um, I'm really pleased. I won't give you death by PowerPoint. I'm really pleased uh, that it's come out quite well. It, it, because of its status, it required the attention of these folk. It not only has preserved the plate for the future, but allows it to be properly housed and presented in this museum in absolute best practice. And I would have to say, learning a little bit of Ian's work, that it's also a pointer for those owning the Dirk Hartog plate. The other thing that occurred very much for us in this post-1980s, um, 1990s, was the change in perception of Dirk Hartog Island from purely a Dutch place. It has a lot more going for it, and you'll notice the presence between the, heart, the laying of the Hartog plate and the de Vlaming plate of William Dampier's arrival. You'll also see the arrival of the Macassans and St Arlewin, a Frenchman, and other French folk, including Rose de Freycinet. The fact that Dampier has forgotten in the middle of this, I think, is related to our Dutch-centric approach here in Western Australia, with Dampier way ahead of even Cook and Banks in being our first natural historian, in describing the flora and fauna, in even, even collect, making a collection which can be viewed today. In fact, it is Dampier who first saw the Sturt P, and it should be called the Dampier Formosa, Dampier Formosa. In fact, you can go and see the Sturt P that he collected in, in 1699 uh, in London. I was privileged to be with Hugh to view that collection. The plates are now joined in importance with this, the proof of the French annexation. We, should be, we could have had good wines a lot earlier, and there's my good friend and colleague Bob Shepherd and myself with the coin as found. These join the Dutch relics. We have a very strong French element now to our work, um, contrasting and comparing the Dutch, and we even note, thanks to... Uh, for, um, thanks to Nick Begordon, my colleague, that the French were taking note of the VOC. In fact, Nick has translated in recent times uh, a journal uh, that was in French of their interaction with the Dutch, or their learning of the Dutch. 
So we have gone a lot broader than we once were. And one would suggest that, of course, we should have. But given that we were very focused in those days with many, many wrecks to deal with, many threats to them, it's, it's uh, logical that we did not. But it is equally logical that we do now. The Macassans rose to Freysenay Dampier. They're the first cultural exchange, other than William Dampier's stay at, at Cape Levique, what is now known Cape Levique, with the Aboriginal people, uh, at Shark Bay with Rose de Freysenay, and of course Rose de Freysenay's own story. Today we also get into the mind of folk. We get the uh, specialists to help us do so. Bodan, for example, writing up there that he couldn't understand how people could seize lands that, uh, from folk who do not deserve the name savage as has been uh, given to them. We're looking at most recent publication on the one on the left, European Perceptions of Terror Australis, looking at the Bodan thing, um, the way he was vilely written out of the voyage, one by myself on who do you trust, discrepancies between official and unofficial accounts. People write for an awful lot of reasons and the unofficial accounts are often the truest. But I, if, coming back to the VOC, an extremely important chapter in this book on this one here, Perceptions of Terra Australis Through the Prism of Batavia Wreck, a very learned piece of work and quite long, which I recommend to anybody interested in the perceptions. So we've gone from the picture on the left, which was produced at the time that Phil and Hugh and Max Kramer and everyone else was doing their work, to round about the time, uh, 80s and so on, with this map by Scott Sledge, uh, showing a much broader interest in the colonial sites to this one here, which is the most modern, showing that we've really burgeoned in our interests, as one would expect. I love this, the common man. We do have many, many Dutch scholars working with us nowadays, and they're looking at it from a wide variety of perspectives, including, of course, the art. One would hesitate to say that would represent the group here, but yeah, I think it's a wonderful thing um, that we have. But talking about the common man, we have literature that looks for all of us. Peter Fitzsimons, I think, is more for those not too interested in the, sto in the truth, but a good story. And I must tell you, Peter's a friend, and I assisted him with the work, so, and he knows what I believe. It's a good story, but there's a lot of Peter in there. My preference, of course, is for some of those by our colleagues here, and, of course, Mike Dash's work, which I think is without par. You'll see there Philip Playford's Carpet of Silver and lots of Hugh Edwards' work. You might not have seen this thing here. It's a graph that I ran across accidentally showing the publications. And the Batavia, of course, is really one that's being published so often, going right back to the numbers of works that you see here in this little bar graph. Lots of scholars at work now in Holland and so on, initially wondering what Jeremy Green, Meyer, or Pat Bagan Company were doing here and now realising their own importance. And you're finding Dutch scholars realising that theirs was the first multinational. Theirs was the first company to issue stock. Theirs was the first to mint money. Theirs was able to wage war as a company. I know a lot of the Americans would like to do that, some of the neocons, I suppose. And they were the first to establish colonies. Our studies and studies that have come to our attention have also shown us the terrible brutality of colonialism. And I've got to tell you, I don't think anything has changed. The British uh, were not immune from the Dutch brutality, um, but I've got to tell you that every colonial power does it to every other group that they colonise. There are obviously negatives and positives in what every group does, and here is the extraordinary breadth of the Dutch East India bases around the ocean, and they are being studied now individually by many scholars. Research papers are coming in very regularly, some beautifully illustrated, some giving contemporary illustrations and so on. This one, as editor of The Great Circle, I received just the other day. It's, uh, Myra had a look at it for me and said it was beautifully written. Um, it's uh, interesting in its title, though. It's the transfer of knowledge. So, again, as I was saying, we're getting away from purely the objects and the ships into sometimes people's minds. 
and this one on the right here by peter reinders um, uh, as why did the largest corporation in the world go broke and this of course he's referring to the voc rupert uh, one of our good friends of the museum is a great supporter did an awful lot of work chasing the uh, gilt dragon folk and other stories a great scholar actually um, even though uh, many people were not that impressed with some of his work, especially in linguistics, I would have to say that, that across the board, Rupert has been extremely good. Uh, and his latest, just before he died, was on the Immenhorn, which was a, 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 a voyage known, I think, only to Jeremy Green, Jim Henderson and Myra and a few others, but little known to other people as a visitation to this coast. The universities have grabbed the VOC with, with alacrity. Um, the universities, Flinders here, many overseas, Gothenburg, of course, Notre Dame over here with Shane Burke and UWA, of course. Um, that's one of the course structures over there. And uh, one of those manifestations is Bob Shepherd's honours at UWA. So from this, which was the fixation we had, which is a wonderful fixation, I've got to tell you, there's myself, well-dressed as usual, on the bottom right, Jeff Kimpton, our chief diver, Bob Richards. On Fixation's the wrong word, but concentration on the objects we, uh, underwater to this. And this is where we are today with the gilt dragon. I got hammered by a scholar just yesterday for using the words gilt dragon. And quite rightly so, but as you saw, uh, our struggle with the words sometimes, I find guilt dragon so much easier, and so I apologise for the Dutch amongst you for not saying for Hilda Drag. This is where Bob has been concentrating, and I've stolen some of Myra's slides here, which you'll recognise. And I've got to say, we were a bit late, more than a bit late, in getting there. I think we should have been here a lot earlier. A key question that Bob has begun, answered and he now has brought the archaeological community along with him in answering this question. I'm hoping Bob will also tell the story of Alan Robinson, the great pirate, uh, because this is very much part of it, just as much as some of the pirates have been part of everything else we've ever done. Peter and Jill Worsley are here. Their book, Windswept Coast, um, the illustrations from there, and they've done wonderful work in putting the Dutch within a broader context. And here is Bob's um, honours thesis. I was pleased to, uh, to be a supervisor of it. And here is Bob with the famous gilt dragon urn, which he's just had studies returned to him from Japan, which are um, not the urn, the um, uh, incense urn. Yep, it's not an incense urn, but he'll tell you more about that in the lecture coming up. And there he is with Peter Beth one of our great archaeologists. Bob's lecture is on the 12th of this month. Um, I'm not going to preempt it except to say that Bob has examined the land camps over the last 12 years plus the stories and he has come to a conclusion that uh, get, got him the honours degree and he's part of a group that is going up there to examine some of his findings. The question that Bob is attending to is what happened to those 68 men? What happened to those who were lost looking for the dragon? And I'm not going to um, say any more except to tell you that he also has a blog, which uh, we often reproduce on our Facebook. We have Facebook, Twitter and all those things nowadays. Always you get hoaxes. And one of the things Wendy did was to have a look at one of the hoaxes to do with the dragon, uh, which appears uh, just north of here, and uh, it, it did appear um, soon after the wrecks were found uh, in this form here on rocks. It's been seized upon by numerous people who insist that it's real and that the who are the museum who don't have any expertise in these sorts of things. And, of course, when you don't have expertise, you bring in those who, who do have it. Um, the engraving is here today. You can see it down the bottom here. And Wendy and her associates have shown that it's almost certainly um, contemporary with the finding of the wreck and the fact that in between the time it was first seen in this picture and this one here, if it was going to get to that stage in 40 years, how did it last for 300 is an obvious question. But she's attended to all sorts of issues like the fonts that are used and, and so on and so on. And it's some wonderful work. 
Um, we've also had to deal with, in, in the, back, the back rooms, things like Henry's work, uh, Henry um, claiming that there was a Dutch settlement here and so on. The evidence for it is, is um, limited at best. We're a public institution. I'm a public archaeologist. So we're developing exhibitions and we're spreading ourselves around. And, and the Dutch need to be seen today in the context of the great ocean, oceanographic um, events. The uh, Ibn Battuta, a great favourite of mine, the voyages of the Portuguese. And the thing at the bottom there is Nick Burningham's, I would say, pretty uh, definitive work on what Cheng Ho's boats really did look like. And I'm using Cheng Ho as an anglicised uh, version. Nick has uh, done his estimates and gives it about 50, 57, 57 metres as a maximum for that sort of thing. And Nick will publish on that in time. Some of the materials that we have are sent over. Here's the artefact management team at the time. Why they're wearing um, crash helmets, I don't know, but it seems that that's the thing we have to do nowadays, and high-vis vests, but it's a great picture. And the Dutch were so keen on what was happening here with uh, Myra, Jennifer, Wendy and Ross um, to, that they sent this container over which was suitably inscribed on all sides with the wonderful VOC images and so on. And this particular one was on its way to an exhibition. So though that's how they appeared. But they have been shown in recent years throughout Holland. And there's some quite beautiful exhibits that have fo uh, focused on the Dutch. And of course, the Dutch now are rightly very proud of their, their, their Dutch shipwrecks and the works that Jeremy and Company have pioneered and are now returning back to them in, in this form. So it's and there's some of the objects at the bottom and the middle slide, the one I've squished in, pays homage to those artefact ma um, managers who so wonderfully pack and send and catalogue and do all the things that I'm hopeless in doing. We also have sent exhibitions to the regions, uh, Geraldton of course, uh, one at Calbarry there. Uh, there's a new one down in the Maritime in the Shipwreck Museum. Um, crediting the finders of the Gilt Dragon, of which Graham Henderson, our former director and one of the leaders of our colonial rec program, is here today. And uh, it's really, for, I think, very correct that we give due credence to the finders, the Hughes, the Maxes, the Phils and all the others. Most recently, an exhibition at the Concert Hall with Jeff Kimpton's magnificent VO, uh, model of the Batavia. Uh, there, this, for a man who builds facades and, and uh, ships and, and uh, was once brought out up from a thousand feet underwater in a big gym suit, um, he's just shown remarkable skill in producing this model. And then we got ourselves all our objects repatriated. It's quite interesting, the Dutch repatriated. There's Wendy and the Dutch consul and the minister. And of course, Alec, Jeremy, and the Minister again, and the Premier. Such an event. Behind the scenes, there's an enormous amount of management of these things. Here's our artefact management team um, at work cataloguing, and also they have audits, regular audits, to ensure that everything is where it should be, even down to the, the appropriate um, drawer and so on. So it's, it's very important that this be done, but you don't hear about it, you don't get to see it, but there is a team that get involved very under Myra's uh, good guidance in doing so. As public archaeologists, we're committed to um, the museum, of course, and of course the new museum is very much on our horizon with Kareli from our staff now very much embedded uh, within the new museum and with its curators uh, joining us only today for a tour to see what sort of crossovers there may have been. The little girl and the little boy on the right uh, the most magnificent pictures because, again, I like to hark back, and I know lots of other people do, to the Indigenous links that we have. And with the Zoutdorp, after 1986, our horizons lifted from the silver much to the people and the most magnificent picture, I think, that we have in the collection of Charlie Mallard with the console from the Zoutdorp. Most magnificent human picture 
with the exception of uh, Samson, I would suggest. So here we are focusing elsewhere. Here's Jeff Kimpton and our on-site conservator, which again is a major behind-the-scenes issue, conservation, which you don't see much about, John Carpenter, looking at this most glorious officer's cup, uh, glass that Jeff recovered from the Zoutdorp with the wreck behind. But I would say equally important is an original of the sort of plate that they hammered to make the Hartog and Devlaming plates. But our focus needed a site plan and any good shipwreck um, site plan it has to be um, good uh, to enable you to say the sorts of things you want to say about what it means. Here, however, we actually used aerial photography and there's Jeff, um, also a very good artist. We actually did the work underwater with a builder's tape, one of those retractable ones. To do so, we, had, we used aerial photography. And uh, here is a dollar put in huge amounts of effort for us in putting a graticule across the wreck, allowing us to see through the water. And then for Jeff, I hold the zero end of tapes, by the way, I need to tell you, um, for Jeff to measure the distance between the rocks and between this anchor and that anchor and the rocks that we could see in that picture. And that was how we came to have our site plan, the one that you see here. Thanks also to Mankel Stanley Hewitt, a retired art architect draftsman who one day came in looking for something to do and very quickly got on to that. Volunteers are very much a big part of the museum and I see Curtis here today and uh, numerous others like the Worsleys and other folk here who help us, Jill and others who are in the gallery, uh, Copper John there, the whole load of folk who assist us, it's essential. The big question though is this. And our work was able to show that Phil Playford's postulation that they got off, his record of there being uh, evidence of, an, of uh, occupation at the top was possible using the, this record that we put because even though it comes from a, a scholar such as Phil, these things have to be tested. We now know the Zoutdorp actually lay up against the reef because the bell of the Zoutdorp is actually stuck here in the reef. It's not on the ground, it's there. And that can only have been there if something was supporting it as it fixed in. That was Stanley's image, by the way. He was also an artist of some note. So to answer it, we bring in our best archaeologists that we can get at the time. To answer the questions, there John Carpenter taking video of Fiona Weaver and Richard Castles. And we actually took a quantum leap and brought in a metal detector who actually brought himself in and uh, to the program, Bob Shepherd, And uh, Bob was actually wanting to write a novel on the Zoutdorp and then very quickly told us of his skills and they replied in searching for the movement of this, the survivors uh, away from the wreck using metallic objects that obviously the Aboriginal people would not have used. At the time, this was seriously looked down upon. We also took the museum's um, then watchkeeper, Dom Lamera, who'd been hunting for the Dutch in his own right, and he joined and took us to all the wells and soaks. And with Bob and with that list of, of pretty high-powered archaeologists below, we examined the wells and soaks that Bob was able to uh, point us, uh, that uh, Dom was able to show us and Jeff and I were able to find. The Zoutdorp has also been a watershed in the use of metal detection in maritime, in, in archaeology. Here, Bob normally trails a chain behind him which marks the ground that he's been so thorough. And here is something that we used up at Whale Well um, with Philip Playford in, in making sure that he a, I was able to say I've been through everything. It's just the car tracks. But what has happened in the joining of the, his metal detection work with the archaeologists and going for minimum disturbance and placing of flags of different colour to indicate what metal lies beneath, this for copper, this for iron, this for silver, uh, we're able to tell the archaeologists, well, if you don't dig over there, you're going to miss that over there. And in fact, if it had not been for Bob, the French bottle at, at uh, Dirk Harlig Island would still be there today. So Zoutdorp has seen the, the introduction of heritage metal detection skills under Bob and his son Zach uh, into, not, into maritime archaeology with St Arlawan, the French wreck perseverant, 
Ned Kelly's work, Batavia's Graveyard, Long Island and The Gilt Dragon. So interesting development there and not without quite some considerable effort on our part and Bob's in validating the study, but it's there now thanks to Bob. There was no Dutch indigenous interaction at the Zoutdorp that we can prove. Kate here is at our normal afternoon sundowner contemplating the fact that she has dated the Aboriginal sites to four to 5,000 years BP. We also supported Philip who joined, uh, very kindly joined our team to assist us and let us know what he knew about the place and its people and the indigenous sites in his postulation that the Dutch moved north to a place called Whale Well, which you'll see just at the bottom of Dirk Hartig Island, uh, sorry, of Shark Bay, and that they would be there. And thanks to Bob and Tony Cobain, who actually found the object, this uh, relic was found. Phil equally importantly was able to show that these objects are from the Kalbarri region and that they had been moved the 70 or so miles north by Aboriginal folk in trade. So what this has proven to us is that there certainly was movement of Aboriginal cultural material in the region behind the wreck. What we don't think has happened is that they were actually living near the coast. Philip has plans to go back there and that has the support of the museum. Our works are there, Philip's uh, award-winning carpet of silver there, my own technical reports and so on, uh, and uh, those things appear as one would expect. However, we were beaten, Jeff and I, and the rest of us who like to push it a bit by the advent of health and safety legislation, and the wheels literally fell off. It got that stupid that we weren't even allowed to take the four-wheel drive into the field because Lend-Lease wouldn't let you take your four-wheel drive in without great sort of penalties and all that sort of stuff. Jeff, by the way, is at the bottom of that line. You can see in the bottom left there's a line going into the water and he's at, uh, at the bottom of that and that's yours truly jumping in at the top. Deb's only seen these pictures of, of late. So that was the end of our field work for, for that period. However, we didn't stop. Wendy became a fundamental part of it all. Uh, here's her report on the scans of that console. Um, beginning to study the dendrochronology, the timbers and so on. Uh, this is an enormous ramification. Some of her work is leading to the realisation that some of the timbers used on some of our ships were actually also some of the timbers used to frame some of the great artworks of the world. Interesting stuff, more to come. And this is part of her report. As always, scholars don't always agree. Uh, Wendy um, also helped develop a group to look at the ingots that Jeff and I raised over the years, a very important study, very interesting study in trade. Um, those ingots, wonderful work Jim Steadman, um, one of the archaeologists from UWA, um, led as part of his honours and Wendy put it together in an, in an internationally recognisable form. Um, Wendy is big on, on different spelling, uh, being uh, Dutch and all that, and insists that it's this. Um, however, what we've learnt is that there are many ways of spelling it, and that we've stayed here in Western Australia with the ones that we've been led to uh, from the earlier scholars. Arguments continue. As I said, I got it in the neck about using Gilt Dragon and then I had the way we'd spelt uh, Zaywick in the flyer <laughs> just about a day before I came here. It all ended nicely, but that's how it works. There was also a hoax uh, on the Zoutdorp, um, with, which again some of the um, so-called specialists in uh, rock art demanded that it was real, but uh, Philip quite clearly showed that it was not, apart from Wendy who showed that it was not from other reasons. Um, there being a wonderful picture on the bottom right, which was part of Philip's early group in 54, showing the place that the Zoutdorp um, inscription was with the chappie whose hat is being blown off because he's standing in a blowhole, uh, and the place where the Zoutdorp was supposed to be clearly not there in 1954. So that inscription clearly postdates 54, thanks to some of the images. Hoaxes sometimes go beyond that, and Dominic, sad to say, um, not only uh, under the amnesty declared some beautiful coins, but didn't declare a lot of, um, of the Schellingen, and eventually later on was dobbed in by 
uh, a relative and uh, his silver was found in his chukran or somewhere of that nature. And this is the sort of behind the scenes thing that, that Myra Jen and, um, Wendy and all the crowd have to deal with is looking at these seizures and getting everything correct. They're in those u sort of evidence bags and all that sort of stuff. You don't see this, you don't hear about it. This is one of the other things that are links to the general, uh, the general um, public and other interests and research groups, of which this one is very strong, or was, um, and they're very strong um, and do some beautiful work, but they're very strong on, um, on the issue of the Indigenous European connections um, is one of the things, and the, so are the Dutch. The Dutch love it. These are a couple of um, excerpts from Dutch um, works uh, on the blind Aborigines, but to date, none of that has been resolved. The Porphyria variegata link, which was very keen at one stage, has been shown not to have any greater than a normal uh, incidence in populations. So while they are allowed to do that and can do that, we have to be much more circumspect in the way we manage such things. Uh, down the bottom, there's an interesting new book on the Zautor, Peter Purchase. And we also have to point, and sometimes not to pleasure to those who, who point elsewhere, to other issues such as the landing of 120 Malay boys between ages 12 to 14 on this ship, the Xantho. They are from Batavia. So if you look to Dutch genes in the population of Shark Bay, one would have to look first to the Malay folk who were abandoned quite often by Charles Broadhurst and many of whom stayed and became the mainstays of the shark bait population. We also need to look at this again, often considered to be a Dutch East Indian, uh, Colin Jack Hinton from the museum, one of the people who suggested it was. It lies at Walga Rock inland from Calberry. And Stanley, my artist, um, had a look at this. Uh, this was sort of quite incidental in his preparation of a, another image of Zoutdorp in the suggestion that this is a, a mainmast, that thing in the middle of the, red, of the Aboriginal paint picture is a mast. Um, it, it appears, however, that it... And if I can draw your attention also to the sail, it appears, however, that it's equally likely to be a steamship which Ian Crawford called me one day and said, could your Xantha have had guns? And I said, no, Ian, but it could have had false gun ports. And he said, as did Charlie Dorch soon after, that they felt that well, it's possible that the Walgarock painting's actually a steamship with what they call a woodbine funnel to create a big draft. Gun ports were common on steamers and on sailing ships in those days. But the other day we realised, thanks to Alex Kilper, one of my colleagues, that so too was, were rectangular scuttles on passenger steamers. And the Xantho, for example, is, was a passenger steamer before a uh, paddle steam before we converted to a screw steamer. So if we put our rectangular scuttles uh, on our supposed Xantho, then we need to accept that, that Walgrock painting could equally be a steamship. I have an honours student now studying that as part of her honours. The other thing I'd suggest to you is the Latin sail, which is shown on all the Dutch East India ships, does not match the sail in our Walgarok picture, which shows more readily a 19th century mizzen. One other study that we've got involved in, of course, is this one with the Zoutdorp, the station folk who found the wreck and their built heritage, their social heritage, and members of the team are here today who have joined with us, Karen Bassett from the museum. This is one of Philip's plans from one of his early ones showing the wreck site and their built heritage. I would suggest to you this is extremely important to preserve. Equally too, Betty's at the bend of Murchison River where a lot of them lived and there's most remarkable oral histories and we have to preserve these before a fire goes through. And luckily, the team, some shown here, um, and um, we're able to find at least a number of them. We still have some more to find. Zawick, magnificent image. Chris Halls, Conrad, Hilt, Conrad 
Marcus Conrad in The Countryman, old wreck maybe the Agdekirk, because these two divers had just been diving up there and had found tusks. And that there on the left is Max Kramer, the late Max Kramer and Hugh Edwards. And the suggestion that this could be the Agdekirke and not the Zaywick at the time was very well founded because here is some research that was produced by Robert Partasius showing that only three ships, that, that, that only one ship actually carried tusks um, of the three missing in Western Australia, or missing and possibly in Western Australia, Fortoyne, Agdekirk and Zaywick, and only Agdekirk had tusks as part of its cargo. So for, for Chris Halls to suggest that the divers in following Agdekirke were right is absolutely to be expected. The museum arrives in the form of Katarina Ingelman Sundberg, who now trundles along on her scooter and writes children's books in Sweden. I, it was her job that I took when she left to chase the Swedish prince. The job came up and I was pleased to get it. There's her report. You can read every one of them. They're all on the web. Here is her site plan showing the wreck out at sea, the areas searched, and you can see there the cannons and so on. Here is the work that uh, was done on the island in searching for the relics and so on. And here is two of our, our great notables in shipwreck archaeology uh, on the island conducting a magnetometer search, Jeremy Green, Graham Henderson. They also did a magnetometer search out of a helicopter. That helicopter is trailing a magnetometer. And leading Graham to conclude when only one wreck was found, other than the ones, colonial ones known, that the Agdekirke is most likely not on the Half Moon Reef, or certainly not in the southern of Rollis. There's Katarina's work there. We've got into the mind a bit here nowadays. Um, Martin Gibbs, shipwreck survivor camps, lots of interesting things now being done by folk that we hadn't even dreamt of. And, of course, this is one of the reasons why archaeologists have to present and record to the nth degree. Hugh never forgot about the ivory and then um, obtained backing from Kerry Stokes, had Frugo fly for him a magnetometer search and presented his reasons. I must take some credit for this, Hugh. When he and I went up to Max Kramer's funeral, uh, we discussed this a lot, and though I said to Hugh, I don't think so, um, I think, Hugh, that you should present your case. And Hugh did so to some uh, um, effect to the museum and presented the evidence that he had been given from Frugro and so on such that it caused the Museum's Maritime Archaeology Advisory Committee, again a, uh, a behind-the-scenes thing, to talk about the work that he was doing and what's required further. Most recently, Hugh has been back to follow more research and he's received quite some press on the subject. He's also received the backing of the museum in it. Um, and here you see the Dutch Embassy asking also for support to commence research in following up his work. One of my students, uh, Chilla here, uh, quite a brilliant young girl, uh, a family excellent in, in archives, could read old Dutch, so I had her look at the story of the Fortuyn to see where that might be. And you'll see on the bottom left there at a meeting that Nick Begordon's attending for us, one of the subjects is the search for the Fortoyne. And you'll see amongst those things HMAS Sydney, AE1, AE2, a much more rounded approach to shipwrecks there, but Fortoyne is part of it. Chiller has concluded that it may be at Christmas or at Cocos. Robert's report came in, uh, assisted by the Foundation, and Robert's conclusions are that he doesn't think so. However, when he was part of the group that was here, like the group which was chaired by Graham Henderson, with Jeremy there, the, the conclusion was that even though some don't think so, the work still must be done and it, because there has to be final proof. As I've said to Hugh, because I like to have my two bobs worth, Hugh, there's much more here about where uh, the sloop was built 
There's the wonderful stories of the people and one of the great things you've done, Hugh, whether the wreck is found or not, is to put a focus back on the Zaywick such that we can now uh, understand it in better terms. Chiller, for example, then took on a much bigger work for us and Jeremy and I supervised this one on providing a database, a modern database, of the losses from the VOC ships of Batavia and Zaywick. It's great stuff. Modern young scholars are just wonderful in the way that they get about things. But here she has listed all those who we expected to be possibly still buried or were buried before the Broadhurst uh, guano industry from the Zaywick. Uh, Jeremy and others have begun ensuring that uh, archives are searched and there's also been searches of the work and the reports of those who first saw Zaywick records. Uh, sorry, Zaylic material on the, on the reefs. Again, you can read them all. Finally, only a week or two ago, Jeremy came back from the Abrolhos and produced this report, which again you can read, on his looking at geo-referencing a 36-year-old survey plan. The point being made is that the, the work that uh, Catter and others had done could not be properly referenced in modern terms to the, the standards we require and here, for example, airborne magnetometry happening, you need pinpoint accuracy with these things, even though you can cover great ground very quickly. Here's the sorts of results that you get. Here, for example, are three indicators of a shipwreck uh, up at Ningaloo, one proving to be the Corio de Asia, another being an, a, a shipwreck that was not even in the records. And as we apparently... Uh, know nothing of it just yet, even though Graham has been exhaustive in his research for unfinished voyages, but this wreck appears in Indigenous legend. So it's interesting that the Aboriginal stories have been proven in this case. This is what we're looking to do, but what Jeremy's done in the interim is match the Frugro data with the data from Katarina using a rock, huge great rock, which appears on both plans the Frugro plan and Katarina's plan shown in that red arrow top right. And what he has found is that they do match to within good parameters and now we're into the next stage where we can start going with Hugh and Frugro and others to finalise that work. We are public archaeologists. We work in the gallery. We like to have the people around us when we work. I think that's the essence of a good museum. I learnt this watching Jeff Kimpton build the Batavia. He was in there in his overalls and when he wasn't welding and swearing, as I told the people from the new museum today, the gallery was open and people could watch him at work. That's a true living museum. Here's Wendy at work uh, doing her, shipwreck, uh, her ship studies and she has a course in it now at Flinders University. Beautiful picture of Wendy and Bill Leonard, the great Bill Leonard. For those who don't know, uh, built but, um, Endeavour and Dalfkin and the set for Master and Commander. New, new work on old ships. Trouble is it's all rotting away. And there's Vicky Richards, uh, one of our conservators, again behind the scenes looking at the problem of acid formation in the Batavia timbers caused by the sulphate-reducing bacteria. It's there in every one of them. It's there in the Viking ships, in Mary Rose, in Vasa, in the Bremen Cog. And she has worked with her colleagues, Ian McLeod, Ian Godfrey, and many others, to go overseas to assist them and also to come back with the answers for here. Again, behind the scenes, again, something you won't see or hear much of unless you read those sorts of journals. I, as I said, read the abstract and the conclusion. That's the easiest way. They're on to it well. Other studies you don't see are Walter Bloom's. Uh, lectures to the numismatic community. Um, and they're always interested in all sorts of esoteric things, as, as uh, collectors are, and they have every right to, to all these sorts of information, and it's out there in our databases. But most in interestingly, on top of one of his older things, I've superimposed a new thing. Now, I bet none of you can handle this. Laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. <laughs> <laughs> Elemental fingerprinting 
uh, being run by some of the team, Lisa Gentili doing her PhD, on top of the work that Walter's doing, and this is behind the scenes, including DNA work on that ivory. The graveyards. The wreck. Our commitment to the divers, to kids, the underwater display case, the museum without walls. Your museum was the first to establish a wreck trail in the Southern Hemisphere. We like to see ourselves as leaders and we have to work hard to stay there. And we do that with some of the young folk that we've now taken on board. This is still a beautiful picture. Henrietta over the top of the remains of the Batavia. What this also does is show you how small a part of the wreck we actually have because it's stretched all the way up to those anchors. If you're going having a look today, look for the hole in the reef. In fact, it's exactly what I said to some of my friends who were trundling up there for a dive, the Maclean's, how to find it. I said, look for the hole in the reef. And they did. There, Pat Baker has superimposed the ship over it. There today, you can have a look and see Jeremy in that hole. You can just go and Google that and you can actually uh, take this tour uh, in a virtual sense. So we've actually changed and gone a long way beyond where we were. Declaring of historic, listing under the Heritage Acts and so on, something that's taken a while but now is well in place. The terrestrial sites at, Be at Beacon Island and Long Island, the commencements of the excavations in 2001, the continuation of Martin Gibbs's uh, work on survival strategies there, a thesis by um, Ben Marwick, based upon things, and again, one of Myra's slides, based upon all sorts of things and ports different to the ones that we used to deal with. The advent of the young into our world, post-disaster behaviour, and this is one, of course, that many of you know a bit about. One of the most horrific pictures, I think, in the collection. Nothing seems to change, it appears. And, of course, it, some of these, the good and the bad, is that you're able then to use some of these remains to answer questions about health and welfare and so on of these people and, of course, to helping to tell their story. Here's Myra and Juliet Passveer, uh, one of the uh, uh, forensic scientists. Another team of forensic scientists here. They had to chuck some poor person out needing an MRI scan, it appears. Other experts. And the papers are just extraordinary. Dan Franklin. Here we have uh, Dr Watlings. And then, of course, this is what excites everyone. But I, I uh, challenge any of you, and I'm, going to, I'm not going to donate my head to the job, but um, I was going to say that what should happen is they should be given a head of somebody who we all know and be given the job of seeing if it works and whether it looks anything like that head. A fairly simple thing to do, I would have thought, but I'll keep mine on for now, thanks. <laughs> but isn't it fantastic stuff? Apparently it is based on science, and there's Stephen not um, doing his work. This is all stuff that's coming out and, of course, da uh, Chiller's databases and then some wonderful stuff that's been happening with the Dutch archives, finding the original documents and reading them. Here you'll see Pelsart's, uh, Francisco Pelsart's uh, signature. Beacon Island survey is underway now. Ground penetrating radar, there's Bob on, on uh, Beacon Island. There's the places that uh, the team, including himself, were part of in the survey of Long Island. There are the reports. You've probably all seen the time team and how good Geophys is. Well, Geophys sometimes doesn't work. And G ground penetrating radar has not proved successful on Beacon Island. Here is the beginnings of the regreening. First, that patch you see, um, which is the beginnings of the um, removal of parts of the vegetation to examine where there may be graves, and that's been returned back to natural. The removal of the shacks. This amazing work being undertaken here uh, by um, some of our scientists from UWA and from uh, University of, um, and Curtin University. 
when I, um, why he was doing that, I didn't know until I had seen him. And of course, some of the more common um, things we have to, if you're going to remove these things, you must record them. Why? Because the fishes are just as much an important part of our society as anything else. And if you're going to remove evidence of their wonderful work uh, for the economy and for themselves as society, you must record it. Now, look at this. Paul Burke and, and, um, and company. This is some of the 3D records. There's the minister announcing the removal of the huts. And this is a bubble thingy inside the huts. So the huts have been recorded before they're removed in a form that you can then disassemble and see exactly as the schoolroom on Beacon Island was. One of the living huts, and my favourite, this then, of course, the uh, islands need to be protected while the archaeology occurs, and this is occurring right now, such that the ground can't be disturbed in the interim as a team called the Roaring Forties team goes up there and commences its work on, an, on a grant that was uh, received to look at these sites and to apply new technology. I think Jeff and I will have a quiet bet as to whether they can produce a plan as good as ours for Zoutdorp and Stanley, but, you know, we'll see how they go. The, the gauntlet's thrown down. This is the team. That's the people you saw early on, plus some of our staff who are not on the team. It's quite an amazing team, right from all around the world, that is now going to take the East India studies and some of the pre-colonial wrecks, including the rapid, which Graham worked, um, and so on, and uh, do, do their sort of science and all those wonderful things with it. So watch this space, and they hopefully will achieve these aims. One of the things they will do is present at a thing called IKUA in 2016, which is a major um, um, conference that is happening here, and you see there in the middle the, the team that has brought IKUA to us. On the left, the old school book, which I still use on the Maritime Exploration of Australia by Jacob and Velios, a school group of young scientists coming in to talk to our conservators, Ian Godfrey and co. And on the right, and to finish off, the development of a website by Carmelo Melfi, which you'll see Hugh there as part of the launch with the National Trust and the Dutch Ambassador. Thank you.